The physician is a, a, a person, not simply a technological instrument, a person with moral convictions. See? And if he doesn't follow those in, in his or her medical practice, you have a fractionated person. Uh, the second result of the secularization that is constantly occurring is a complete dichotomy, an increasingly co complete dichotomy between uh, the role of the physician and the person. And the person. Now we need roles in society. I'm not knocking roles. Um, society functions harmoniously when we all play our roles in a harmonious way. But the role is not the person. People wonder, for example, when dealing with actors and actresses uh, who are playing a role, what they're really like in person. They'd like to get to know uh, that person behind the mask. So the person is not necessarily the role. When I relate to people exclusively through my role, for example, as a priest, the danger is that I don't grow as a person. I cultivate certain virtues, uh, certain communication skills, or whatever, only in my role, they don't dig into my person. So the real danger, it seems to me, of the secularization of the profession uh, with regard to uh, the person of the physician is this. There is, on the one hand, the growth of the role, but the stunting of the person, see? and therefore a kind of externalization of value to the role, or there's just the opposite. There is a restriction of values to the private person and not in the role. I'll do anything you want. A kind of privatization of values. Either represents a violent split or separation in the personality of the physician. Uh, the next I shall discuss with you is the move toward administered dying. Now let me, as, to set the scene here, uh, some of you may or may not know that a large percentage of AIDS patients in Holland, it's estimated around 80% from some of the physicians I've talked to, um, die by voluntary euthanasia. There's a relatively strong move to legislate the possibility there. In the United States, Derek Humphrey is, is known for his initiatives in California to get that. It was on the referendum last November. It failed. It'll be back again. Um, any number of polls have indicated 35, 40% of physicians who would practice positive euthanasia if it were legalized. There is great public confusion on this issue, specifically on the difference between killing and allowing to die, killing, administering potassium chloride, a shot of potassium chloride, for example, allowing to die, removing a respirator from a terminal patient. Great confusion on that. In the Quinlan case, Judge Muir stated that removing Karen Quinlan from the respirator would subject those who did so to the homicide laws of New Jersey. We've had similar confused statements repeatedly since that time. In the Paul Brophy case, a recent case that uh, involved artificial feeding, uh, the dissenting minority regarded this as simply killing, removing the feeding tube of Mr. Brophy. Now, the, the symbol of this confusion is our present analysis of the removal of artificial nutrition and hydration. We've been struggling with that for the last four or five years in the United States. People don't seem to know how to handle it. Uh, allowing such removal at times would be the President's Commission, the American Medical Association, many moral theologians, many Catholic moral theologians, a few cardinals, and so on. Disallowing it would be some other bishops, some doctors, some nurses, a few theologians. So it's a debated issue. But beneath this issue, I see a much more ominous threat. The danger that in facing a simple problem like artificial nutrition and hydration, we will lose our grasp 
on the basic value that we are protecting, the substance of our moral conviction. Now, I judge, therefore, that the basic value judgment that the the Catholic tradition, and by and large the Christian tradition following it, the basic value judgment in these cases is something like this. Life is a basic value, but not an absolute one. Death is an evil, but not an unconditioned one. You see, That's the basic value judgment that we must carry into new technological circumstances. It's not the casuistry of ordinary and extraordinary measures and things like that. No. Now, the reason I see this as an ominous threat to our grasp on this value judgment is that those who are arguing that we ought to keep, by artificial feeding, people alive in a persistent vegetative state must at some point say that this is a benefit to that person. And they have indeed said that. Keeping you alive, just as a vegetable, is a great benefit to you. At that point, I think they have lost their grasp on the substance of our concern. You see, Catholics, for example, do not measure good dying by the accumulation of minutes. They don't. Other traditions would. But we try to relativize life and death within the Paschal mystery. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, in contemporary times, when a very pragmatic people, when a corpse is a corpse, no matter how it got to be that, we are in danger of losing our grasp on this value judgment, which I think is very important, independently of how it happens. Uh, the next area, and I think what I'll do is skip the problem of paternalism. I've said that already. I will take one more area, which I think is going to increasingly become a problem for us. That has to do with the moral status of the preembryo. Now, the preembryo is the term given to the fertilized ovum up to the point of implantation in the uterus. That would mean from the process of fertilization, roughly anywhere from 10 to at the outside 14 days. We call that the pre-embryo because after that point you have the, uh, the development of uh, the embryonic axis. And we uh, properly call what happens then at the point of implantation uh, the embryo. And then, of course, later the fetus. Now, the evaluation of that, why is that a problem? It's a problem for this reason, that in reproductive technology we have several phenomena that are going to be with us and already are. We have the production of five or six fertilized ova, and only four are transplanted in, in fertility clinics. Uh, two are frozen. Why? Well, that uh, if it doesn't work the first time, you simply thaw the two frozen embryos and try again the next cycle without having to uh, uh, drug up the woman and... Uh, stimulate, uh, re-stimulate the ovaries to produce more eggs. You save this process. You see. Secondly, you have uh, increasingly the desire on the part of basic physiologists, reproductive physiologists, to want to get at the pre-embryo because they feel they can get at the causes of genetic disease and other diseases. At that stage, and eventually correct them by therapeutic intervention. There is, I just learned last week, there is a, uh, a process now uh, that is available to us by DNA technology whereby we can throw on widescreen, many hundreds of thousands of times magnified, a single gene. You see. Now imagine what that means. You can throw up there and look at it and examine it. If you begin to see pathologies there, irregularities, you begin to understand how you might intervene to correct those. You see. Um, in other words, scientists are at the point 
where they feel that for the good of human persons, they want to intervene uh, and micro-manipulate the preembryo. Now, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because, for example, in the Catholic community, in 1983, John Paul II stated, I condemn in the strongest possible terms any manipulation of the human embryo. Uh, no one can be manipulated for other purposes from the moment of conception until death. On the other hand, you have a well-known theologian such as Karl Rahner and others who believe that it is morally permissible to do so because of the doubtful character of what you have at that stage in human life. So the issue is this. How do we assess, give moral status to the pre-embryo at this point? Now, why is that a problem? You have a lot of interesting phenomena that occur in that period uh, that create evaluative doubts. It's not, the question is not when does human life begin. We all know that. You see, I remember uh, being in Washington when uh, the Senator East introduced his human life bill. It was a, a kind of an attempt on the part of the uh, a Senate committee to redefine uh, the beginning of human life in such a way that it would invalidate the present legalized abortion laws. Human life begins at fertilization. That's what he was proposing. And uh, so they, they were having these hearings, and I was invited to come by uh, Bill Moyers to come to make a segment on that uh, for his television show. And I got into the Dirksen Senate office building, and the place was a circus. He had all the pro-choicers, all the pro-lifers going around with coat hangers and roses and uh, a, a photographer came up to me and said, can I interview you? And I said, sure. And she had her pad and she said, uh, do you believe that human life begins at fertilization? And I said, well, sure, of course. And she said, well, do you mean you have a human person? I said, I didn't say that. And she was very confused. And she started over and said, well, you, you believe human life begins at fertilization? And I said, of course, everybody does. Well, you've got a person then. I said, no, I didn't say that. And she quietly closed her pad and put it in the pocketbook and said, you must be a theologian or something. <laughs> well, the problem, therefore, is not when does human life begin, but how do you evaluate human life at this or this or this stage? Now, the reason for raising the question uh, are the phenomena that occur in the pre-implantation period, the pre-embryonic period. Process of twinning, process of recombination of two fertilized ova into one. There are at least 21 uh, cases where that's the only feasible medical explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the uh, formation of hydatidiform moles, which are under microscopic examination, genetically human. Um, you have the totipotentiality of uh, the zygote at that period. By that I mean you take, say, a mouse preembryo and simply cleave it. It becomes two, without uh, damage to the integrity of either one, you see. Um, you have spontaneous wastage. 50% of pre-embryos never implant. Now, if these are little people, persons, the vast majority of human beings, persons with immortal souls, never got beyond the pre-embryonic stage. Now, that is not necessarily conclusive in itself, but... Uh, it provides a foundation for saying certain things, for certain evaluations. Women, knowing that, do not grieve the way they grieve after a miscarriage. You see, That says something about our evaluation. What I'm basically saying, therefore, is that there, through modern science, there are reasons for serious doubt about the protectable, at least the absolutely protectable status of the pre-embryo uh, as we have come to view it. The standard formulation in the Catholic community has been life must be protected from the moment of conception. You see, well, first of all, conception is not a moment. It's a process. But uh, we have to wonder if that is a fully accurate rendering or formulation, to use my uh, previous language, uh, of our moral convictions at this point, knowing what we now know of the developing biology of the nascent human being. That will remain a question 
and remain a very divisive one, especially in an atmosphere uh, which is so deeply divisive, uh, divisively politicized on abortion. You can watch that one coming, but it's very important in terms of uh, advance in uh, our knowledge of genetic uh, disease, the endocrinology of the human person, and uh, the effectiveness of overcoming infertility problems. So I raise that as one of the issues that I think will be, again, a paradigm. How we face it, how we think about it, will say a lot about uh, how we go about other problems. Now I could continue with many other problems, genetic therapy, the use of fetal tissue from elective abortions, etc., cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think I've said enough to say that uh, if I say more, you will have nothing but problems and nothing but confusion. So thanks very much again. <laughs> Uh, feel strong enough to face a few more questions, please go ahead. <laughs> All right, please. Okay. Excuse me, can you, can you hear, uh, would you perhaps go to the microphone? Um, I would draw to your attention the program at Dalhousie University for the medical students. In any other university in North America, the first contact that the students have with death is the corpse in the, in the anatomy uh, room. In Halifax, this does not take place. First of all, the students with their professor uh, discuss their own attitudes towards mortality and they come to terms with that and with death and dying. This program has been in effect for about five years and it is already showing um, its results in the clinical setting where these, uh, these young, young doctors are very sensitive to um, the poor, the dying and the old as well as the ICU. And um, our 90-year-olds do not immediately go to the ICU. They go to very effective palliative care. Thank you. That's good to hear because uh, it, re it kind of represents a little bit of a, a counter, kind of a reversal of some tendencies you see too often in, in tertiary care centers. Yes? Uh, it really seems, listening to your lectures, that uh, you're on the cutting edge, in, so to speak, between uh, the, uh, the fields of, of religious studies, theology, and the field of science and social issues. They're all intertwined, ultimately, we know, especially from a perspective of faith. But I had a, a nagging question all during the sessions. Good. Um, wondering what, what your personal uh, observations are, considering the past, the historical past of the dichotomy between religion and science, and whether you see the two uh, being united again, and, and what, uh, what hopes do you see there for us? Oh, that's a very good question. And uh, there certainly was in the past a separation, and many factors uh, historically would account for that, I'm sure. And the Catholic Church had no little part in uh, reinforcing that dichotomy in the way it went around uh, and the kind of the biblical fundamentalism it brought to, to certain scientific uh, studies and so on. But the more importantly, the, uh, rather than pointing fingers at the past, is what, what is the future of this cooperative venture? Well, I don't know. I really don't know. I, uh, it's very important that... Uh, people in philosophy, people in theology, uh, be in contact with the scientific community, know their concerns, and indeed uh, have a, 
a passing knowledge of scientific materials. Otherwise, they really can't discuss the ethics of some of these problems. Now, whether that's going to occur uh, or not, I don't know. I, I think that there are people around who have managed to bridge that gap. I see it with physicians who have, and that's only one area of science, physicians who have uh, forced themselves to be trained in ethical thinking. That's, that's, a better, uh, that's a better approach to the question than taking moral theologians or ethicists and forcing them to become acquainted with science. Uh, we're we're going to have a little bit of both now, but I think the better bridge is, is the scientist becoming aware of, of philosophical and theological concerns and schooling herself in those things. Um, but I, I'm a bad predictor, so I won't, I won't try to predict whether it's going to happen and to what extent. Just don't know. I hope that the conversations will continue in an open, uh, sympathetic way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Father. I'm a, I'm a Roman Catholic sister who's a doctor, who's got a big interest in ethics. So. Uh, wow. Yeah. It's a. And, and I've been a fan of yours. You should for be a giving long, these. Been a fan of yours for a long, long time. Well, you sound like me, so one of us is right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just one element that um, I, I think especially in, in the talk you've done this afternoon I kept thinking about, and maybe it's because I am a doctor, and, and it's kind of the other side of some of the coin. Mm -hmm. um, I thought when you were talking about public morality, and that's an issue that I have grave concern about, because I repeatedly say we have no common morality in this country. We ha most people have no sense uh, well articulated of their values, and, and the individual choice autonomy thing you spoke of so well is really driving things. I, I think that it's fair, though, for everyone in our society to understand that we all make the decisions or don't make the decisions that get made or not made. And what I see happening in the demand on the healthcare system, because that's where I, I receive a lot of it. I'm a pediatrician father, so mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time with a lot of training behind me playing grandmother and big sister and friend who can babysit at incredible cost because our social system doesn't fit our needs. And I guess the bottom line for me is I feel there's an issue here where there are many people in our world who believe in medicine and in technology the way they used to believe in God. And they come to science and to technology and the machines because they're terrified of suffering. There's no meaning or context for suffering, and they're terrified of dying. And so the, the, there's a belief in the system that then puts a pressure on the system that has everything to do with value and lack of value. A friend of mine who's a neonatologist says, we moved through the death-denying generation in Canada a decade ago. We're now death-defying because we're scared to death of what our mortality and suffering and death and life are really all about. So some of the problem, I mean, you know, I can't answer for all doctors, but we do some stuff well and some stuff poorly. Mm -hmm. But the expectation and demand put inappropriately on health care to answer value voids in the rest of society is enormous. And that's something we have to deal with together. It's, it's our problem, I think. I'm very grateful for that statement. I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, I had uh, just along those same lines, if I can give you an example of, uh, remember, I, I belong to a group of, of people called the Park Ridge Center out of Chicago. And we, I just came from their meeting, as a matter of fact. We've been meeting for nine years, and they're interested in religion, ethics, and, and health care. And uh, <clears throat> we were talking about some of these cases uh, in medicine, and finally one of the doctors there, who's a very wise man in my judgment, this was some years ago, he said, let's stop talking about this nonsense. He said, whether to pull a plug, whether to do this. And so said, that, that's a lot of nonsense. He said, it's not facing the problem. He said, I'll tell you what the problem is. He said, I have a close friend who's a physician uh, who came to me last week and said, I've just been diagnosed as terminal cancer of the lung. Help me. Those are the problems that never make the papers. But that's what you're talking about, and 
You know, here was a highly trained person who, who just couldn't face it. That's what we have to talk a lot more about together. I have two questions. Uh, what, last night I asked you how you felt, or not how you felt, but how the church reacted to homosexuality, mm -hmm. with, not in marriage. I was wondering that you were talking about homosexuality trying to reach a normative state. Well, I was wondering if um, homosexual priests, have they reached a nor uh, normative state if they continue to believe in their celibacy? Well, uh, if I understand your question correctly, is uh, I, I know, I'll, I'll reword it and see if I've grasped it. Um, <clears throat> by stating that uh, uh, the heterosexual relationship of marriage is normative, that means that if one is going to have full sexual expression, that is the context in which it ought to occur, the heterosexual relationship of marriage. That has been the Christian tradition. Um, doesn't immediately say anything about whether or uh, what is the condition of someone who is not going to be involved in full sexual expression. There is also, a, of course, a Christian a tradition on that for that goes way back that there is a a witness value uh, to celibacy when chosen voluntarily for the kingdom. Now I don't know whether that's you. Uh, are you really wanting to know whether or not priests, by being celibate, have themselves failed to reach a certain normative state or something? Is that what you have in mind? Or... Well, say it again. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to word it. Mm -hmm. if... You were talking about um, this morning about accepting if they can't change. I see. Um, if homosexuals can't change to come to the normative state, that by being ce being celibate, that they have come as far as they can, that they're actually um, doing doing the best they can with their own condition. Yes, I. I, I was just wondering that if mm -hmm. they do that, if they do their celibacy, then is it possible that the church will accept them as priests? because they, they have done this? Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. In other words, uh, here's someone who, let's say, wants to be a priest or is a priest who discovers that he is homosexual. Yes. Well, and uh, homosexual tendencies. Is yeah, that tendencies, sure. Uh, would the church accept that person as a, a priestly minister? Um, I, I think the prevailing opinion is that uh, one's sexual orientation um, is not of itself automatic reason for exclusion from ministry. That one should first look at one's ministerial credentials, one's ability to minister to people. Now, if the person is homosexually oriented, but under the present dispensation is, learn is uh, determined to live a celibate life, and indeed does, then it seems to me that there's no overwhelming proof as yet that that person is, um, is not fit for ministry. There, there would, there, I think this is a, a somewhat unexplored and also somewhat controversial. There are psychiatrists I know, um, in fact, my own Jesuit colleagues, uh, we have about eight or nine of them psychiatrists who have a very strong position. They're, they come from the Freudian tradition very strong tradition that, uh, or feeling, conviction, that, uh, that the homosexual orientation of itself is a form of arrested development, which could affect ministerial capacity. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that's shared all that broadly beyond this particular group. So I can't speak authoritative for that at all. My, my prima facie impression is that uh, one can minister effectively and relate well with people, even though one is homosexually oriented. Okay, my second question was, so you seem to, seem to have a very accepting attitude. Um, 
to try and understand other people without condemning or even justifying their actions. I was wondering if you've ever run into problems with the church because of your accepting attitude. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, you want to open my mail, huh? <laughs> um, well, you know, there are people who, uh, uh, in various places, you don't always hear about these things, sometimes you do, who exclude you from their dioceses. And, you know, I've been invited and disinvited from a number of places, and uh, uh, you know, I won't mention which they are, but there are maybe eight or ten dioceses where one is not welcome, but that neither here nor there. Um, and nothing that anywhere near what has happened to my colleague and dear friend Charles Curran, who's been disenfranchised from the theological establishment for all practical purposes, but... Uh, no, I think that there are still, there are still people around who, who uh, it's not necessarily an open attitude. That they, would, uh, they would probably land very hard on the fact that you might, in your attempt to achieve greater clarity, find yourself distancing from a past formulation, dissenting from it. They would find that unacceptable, you see. For to me, it's a, a very normal, uh, part of the normal process of growth and understanding. Now, that's simply unacceptable, and I have no doubt that uh, most of these exclusions from places would, would be uh, on that basis. See? But I haven't, I haven't felt uh, the, the, the heavy hand of, uh, of Roman retribution as yet. As yet. <laughs> Which is no predictor of the future at all. But, uh, <laughs> I say that uh, seriously because, uh, you know, the word is out that Cardinal Ratzinger is continuing his examination of Catholic, American Catholic theologians. And it's no secret that his primary concern is moral theologians. And I think I've been around longer than most of them. So. Well, thank you once again for your, uh, your good questions and your uh, receptivity. The Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus, after teaching, asked, have you understood all this? <laughs> they said, yes. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, well then, every scribe who becomes a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his storeroom things both new and old. Father McCormick, you have shown yourself to be such a scribe. You have brought out of your storeroom things both new and old. Personally, I find you extraordinarily gifted. You have a great gift of clarity without undue simplification, of balance without undue wishy-washiness, of breath without vagueness. You have not just given us food for thought, you have given us an awesome banquet. And it will certainly inspire me, as it did in the past for years to come. Thank you very much.
Well, I don't actually. I don't think there's so many committee meetings now, either, but they're still they're still going. You know, and, uh, <laughs> I heard, yes. <clears throat> Still, there's plenty of. Uh, it, it involves lots of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Oh, it's it's, uh, it's it's mounting all the time. Yes. Yes, yes. I'm not sure that it's more productive. That's the trouble. We're spending more and more time doing administrative uh, dancing, and I don't, I don't see that there's an awful lot coming out of it, actually. <laughs> So, good afternoon and welcome back. And it is a privilege to have Dr. McCormick discuss with us the issues on bioethics and Christian ethics. We are fortunate since Dr. McCormick certainly have a wealth of experience, knowledge, to clarify and help us to clarify our own mind about what to do in that field. Father McCormick. I want to share an interesting experience with you. Last week I was giving a lecture, indeed in Canada, and uh, up in Regina, and uh, I was introduced as an expert in reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, told, I told the group that I, I was sharing with that I thought this was rather anomalous. <laughs> but, uh, I picked out the subject of bioethics today because I think it's something of a paradigm. In other words, the way we think about these subjects is going to tell us how we think about many other subjects, the type of discipline we bring to them, 
the type of commitment to value, the type of appropriate modesty and tentativeness in the face of their complexity is going to reappear when we discuss other uh, social moral problems, other personal problems, and indeed other bioethical problems down the road uh, a year or ten. Now let me, before I begin to go into uh, the problems I want to discuss with you, let me try to, to lay out what I think is the shape of a bioethical problem. Most of us are confused because of the very technical terminology that often is the envelope for such problems, medical terminology. And we, we read halfway through it and don't quite understand it. All right. Uh, if you strip away that terminology, very often, not always, but very often what you find is a rather simple structure. And that structure is this, a, a basic human value around which we have developed a policy of protection and promotion because protecting and promoting that value we thrive individually and corporately, socially, and then a vocabulary to communicate that. Now, so value, policy of protection and promotion, and vocabulary. What happens so often in our times is that that value comes into new technological circumstances that forces us to ask about the adequacy of our policy, our moral policy, and the adequacy of uh, the terminology that we have used to, to state that and communicate it. Now, for example, with regard to the preservation of life, uh, with the new uh, nutritional, hydrational technology that we have, we can keep people going almost endlessly. And what you have there is a basic human value, human life itself, its sacredness. And we have developed this policy of protection to make sure that we are not abusing human life when we either withdraw certain life supports or extend them. And then a vocabulary, for example, ordinary and extraordinary measures. Now, that's come into new technological possibilities. We can. Uh, with our resuscitative devices and our maintenance uh, technology, we can keep people going in, a, say, in a persistent vegetative state. And it forces us to ask anew <coughs> in our time, uh, what values are we seeking to preserve when we preserve life? Is it merely life in, in this stage, in the state? Uh, the same thing is true of reproductive technologies. There you have a cluster of basic values, such as the identity of the child, the meaning of the family, the meaning of parenting. You see? All right, we, uh, we're accustomed to promote and protect those. And again, a vocabulary to communicate that. Now, all of a sudden, with the birth of Louise Brown in 1979, um, uh, we, we, have, we have this basic value in new technological circumstances. You see. It forces us to ask anew about the adequacy of our moral policies in protecting these basic values. Now, that's the structure of many of the problems we face. And I think it's helpful to, to hang on to that so you can, uh, you can strip uh, some of these cases that you read about of their non-essentials and their terminology and get to the core of things. I think we can discuss them more intelligently that way. Now, today I want to lift out uh, simply seven or eight areas that I think are problematic. It could be 15 or 20. These are quite arbitrary, but I'm, I'm convinced that uh, they are indeed problems. One or two will reflect my own American background, and, uh, but I think there will probably be some analogs in the, on the Canadian scene to these problems. So bear with me if, uh, if, if there is an irrelevance that appears in some of them, especially the social, uh, political problems in medicine. The very first problem I want to lift out is the problem of increasing depersonalization in medical care and health care delivery. There are three factors at work in the way our health is taken care of within the medical establishment. 
Uh, the first factor is the growth of technology. Now, everything in the acute care setting, everything from billing to diagnosis, is done by computer. Now, that gives uh, efficiency. But one has to wonder about the personality of the treatment, the personalism of the treatment. My symbol for what is happening, it's a very simple little symbol. You may recall the days when you, uh, if you were in a hospital, say, 30 years ago, and you wanted the nurse or you needed something, you would simply depress the little buzzer, and within four or five minutes, this very lovely uh, young lady uh, would appear and smile, and what can I do for you? And uh, it was a very personal thing. Now you press the buzzer, and from back of your head comes, yes, what do you need? Through the... Uh, the system, the electronic system. All right, it saves time, it's efficient, but something is gone in the process of that. All right, so the first factor at play in, in healthcare delivery now is high technology. I'm not knocking it, it saved my life two or three times. Um, CAT scans, MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, things like that, marvelous devices. The second factor at work is uh, cost containment. Now, this is especially true in the United States, and I think it may well be true here, too. Uh, the imperative of cost containment. Uh, escalating costs in health care are due to factors that are immediately recognizable. The sophistication of services, increased personnel, inflation, higher wages, cost pass-along systems, and so on. Now, this is going to force upon us some very difficult decisions, and already has in some countries. In the United States, for example, the end-stage renal disease program, uh, kidney dialysis, is completely supported by the federal government at the cost of $2 billion a year. Well, one has to wonder how that got to be, how that was singled out. Uh, concern with cost containment is going to reinforce the noxious notion that good health care is good hospital care, when most of us think that good health care is keeping people out of hospitals, by and large. Um, in the United States, for example, the health care bill this year will reach 12% of the gross national product. In Great Britain, it's only half of that. And they are at least equal in major health care indicators, uh, which shows, I think, uh, rather conclusively that uh, more money does not mean necessarily better health care. Now, the third factor at work in health care delivery increasingly, what I, I will call public entities, legislature, um, the judiciary, and attorneys. The symbols of this um, are well-known cases, starting with Roe v. Wade on abortion to cases such as Karen Quinlan, Brother Fox, Dinnerstein, Brophy, Nancy Cruzan, whom I mentioned this morning, and on and on and on. All these cases were cases taken to courts. Now, what you have, then, is this. In, in medicine, it has been the conviction for many decades that decision-making is in the best interest of patients when it's contained within the triad of the patient, the physician and nurse, and the family, because these are very personal decisions. They have to fit the patient as a glove fits a hand, circumstantially. Everything has to be molded to the needs of the individual. So they're personal decisions. Now, the three factors I have mentioned, technology, cost containment, legal entities, are precisely impersonal factors. So what do you have? You have impersonal factors playing an increasing role in what are essentially very personal decisions. You see the problem. The problem, then, that I see is a depersonalization of care uh, is the beginning of a kind of medical oppression of patients. 
Now, these factors will increasingly uh, frame the questions that we ask and limit the answers we are allowed to give to our health care problem. I have no answer to this as a, as, a, as a bioethical problem except to say that if we don't advert to it, uh, it's going to be doubly difficult to deal with. So perhaps mere awareness of the problem is the first step toward a possible solution. So increasing depersonalization. Now, the second uh, area that I want to, to lift out, and once again, I, I, I emphasize I'm not presenting a, a group of cases with potential answers, just problems, because you don't have en enough problems now, and uh, I want to give you some more. Load you up. I will call this the emergence of public morality. Now, that's a term that public morality that that we, we bandy about. You see it used in the bioethical literature over and over again. I suspect that uh, nine times out of ten, uh, both the writers and the readers don't have a precise understanding of what that term means. Yet we continue to use it. Let me say first of all what it does not mean and then what I think it possibly should mean. Public morality does not mean, first of all, the participation of the public on decision-making committees and boards. That's a merely formal thing. We have a lot of that going on in the United States, and I suspect you do uh, here in Canada also. Um, being from Washington for 13 years, I'm perhaps hypersensitive uh, to this matter, but uh, how committee people are chosen and so forth. And I say this with, without wanting to indulge in, in any kind of a caricature, but the ideal committee person from the Washington perspective is a black nun. Now why? Because you've covered three or four constituencies in one person. You see? The woman, the black, the religious, etc. So a uh, Public morality is not simply public participation in decision-making committees, policy-making groups. Nor is it, secondly, simply what the law happens to be, public policy at that time. Uh, once again, we know that public policy is the outcome of a great number of quite utilitarian factors. That's the way it comes to be. I scratch your back on this one, you scratch mine when my constituents come up. It's, it's a matter of trade-offs, compromises, give a little, take a little, and that's the way a public policy is formed. It's been said that I think quite accurately there. There are two things we ought never to see in the making. Sausages and public policy. <laughs> and that's quite, quite an accurate statement, I think. Now, okay, that's what it is not. Now, now what, what is it, public morality? I want to suggest to you that formerly many decisions in, that had to do with our health were made within the private sphere, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, physician, family, patient, and so on. And that's going to remain, obviously. But increasingly, you have the presence of groups shaping even making some of these decisions, either by rationing or whatever uh, the measure. Now, by groups, I mean, for example, uh, the government, state, federal, provincial, federal, whatever it might be, uh, or a teaching university, or even group practice, where a group of 10 phys uh, physicians are dividing up um, their work and cooperating together. Now, what is interesting about groups, well, let's use the federal government, for example. Groups have legitimate interests other than the individual patient. For example, uh, the federal government has a very legitimate interest in population control, in reduction of welfare roles, in the improvement of education, in the stability of defense, in the environment, and so on. The very legitimate interests. Now, the interesting thing for me is when 
Uh, the partner in health care delivery has other legitimate interests than the patient, you see, then the danger is that the needs or even perhaps the rights of the individual will be subordinate to these other legitimate interests. Now, public morality, I want to suggest to you, is the proper balance between the needs and the rights of individuals in the healthcare sphere with the other legitimate interests of the group that is partnering healthcare, in this case, say, the federal government. When that is in a harmonious balance, we have a sound public morality. When there is an asymmetry there, then we, we have disharmony at the level of public morality. Now, when healthcare is increasingly mediated by these groups, then it's going to be affected by the dominant values of a particular society, because these groups exist in society, and by and large reproduce as social actors the dominant values of the society. Now, it's no secret in Western democracies, it would be true of Canada, it would be true of the United States, that the dominant values very often are technology, efficiency, and comfort. Now, wh when those begin to be the permeating values that control so many of the policies of these groups, their thinking, you see, then we know very clearly those people who are going to get hurt. We know exactly who they are. The poor, the dependent, the elderly, the retarded, and the ordinary patient. I say that because uh, the ordinary patient's basic health care needs will be subordinated to the, the scintillating, sophisticated, experimental, and dramatic procedures. All right, so watch that one. The emergence of public morality. It will shape, again, it will shape the very way we conceive of our problem. Third area. And this is a little pet of mine. And I, I don't make no apology for it. It's the re-emergence of the eugenic mentality. I say the re-emergence because there's a history of the eugenic movement. It goes back into the 1920s. And we should have learned our lesson. Now, to show you what, uh, what I am concerned about, I will use two recent happenings and two contexts in which they happened and show you that the mix is inflammatory. The first happening is uh, the in vitro fertilization debate that we conducted in the United States. Back in 1979, I was on, as I mentioned, I believe, I was on the Ethics Advisory Board for the federal government, and our first mandate was to report to the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare on the moral or ethical acceptability of in vitro fertilization. We thought that'd be a, a you know, six-week job and talk about it and so forth. Well, Louise Brown was born then. And we spent the rest of the time under television lights and going around the country getting testimony and so on. Spent a whole year on that one subject. And it became clear to us that there was a subtle mentality. It wasn't explicit, but it was there. Uh, the child as a consumer item. Um, give me blue eyes this time. You see what I mean? Um, the second incident was the establishment in Escondido, California, of, of a nasty little institution called the Repository for Germinal Choice. And, and this was an attempt by an ex optometrist, Dr. Robert Graham, uh, to collect the sperm of Nobel Prize winners so that we could produce brighter people, you see. Because, after all, brighter is better, isn't it? Well, those are the two happenings. Dr. Graham s subsequently went into football players and... Uh, was getting sperm from uh, that particular uh, segment of the population. Now, the cultural context in which those occurred were, first of all, the context of increasing sophistication in prenatal diagnosis. 
All right, we have amniocentesis, quite an accurate uh, instrument. Uh, we have ultrasonography. We have maternal alpha theta protein testing. Uh, we have a chorionic villus uh, biopsy. A whole host of technologies now to find out the basic health of the child, the nascent human person. The second context in which these events are occurring is the cultural acceptance of abortion as a medical, legitimate medical procedure. Now, Reflect with me for a moment. When the consumer mentality toward children combines with very sophisticated prenatal diagnosis, you have the powerful uh, soil for the growth of this eugenic mentality. Now, what do I mean by the eugenic mentality? Well, you must distinguish, at least it's traditional to do so, between positive and negative eugenics. Negative eugenics refers to the attempt by counseling, for example, uh, to discourage childbearing by those who are at very high risk for producing a seriously disabled child, one, for example, with uh, recessive genetic disease, and so on. No one has much trouble with that, as long as it's not coerced. Negative eugenics. Positive eugenics, on the other hand, is a beast of a different color. It refers to the deliberate scientific programming of a superior genotype. All right. Now, everybody runs from that. Scientists, uh, philosophers and theologians, as if it were the plague. That's the difference. But I'm talking about the positive eugenic mentality is reappearing in our time. We have... For example, both I su suspect here, I know in the United States, we, al we already have in place indicators of this. We have, for example, people speaking about the right of every couple to a healthy child. Now examine that carefully. The implications of that are, if you have a right to a healthy child, uh, the immediate inference of that is you have a right to discard the unhealthy. Our language can be a corrupting influence if we're not careful. We already have, in the United States, tort for wrongful life. Now, see what that means. That means giving status to the newborn to sue the parents for not having aborted. You see? Not just wrongful birth, but wrongful life. We have, um, have had, in the recent past, uh, situations in the neonatal intensive care unit where parents were presented with the options, either a healthy child or a dead child. The famous Bloomington case, where a child was born with a trisomy 21 Down syndrome, and it had duodenal blockage. And the parents, uh, after consulting with their priest, they were Catholic indeed, decided that uh, correction of the duodenal blockage uh, was unnecessary, indeed was an extraordinary measure. And therefore, the child was allowed to die, with really only defect being that it was a down baby. Uh, we have donor uh, insemination for genetic reasons, when the husband is thought to be a carrier. Um, increasingly, we have um, attempts, we're going to have, I'll get to this later too, we're going to have attempts to experiment on the preembryo. So we have many things in place already that are indicators that our society in general is going in that direction. You see? Now, what is wrong with that? To me, what is wrong with that basically is this. When we pre-program for a certain type of child, an intelligent one, a muscular one, a musical one, whatever, we begin to evaluate the whole that is the human person in terms of a mere part, you see, a single quality. Now, when we reduce the whole, the mysterious whole of the person to a single element of the person by programming for that element, uh, we are well on our way to doing things that civilized societies ought to abhor. 
Now, that's one objection. The second, of course, is very pragmatic. Uh, who decides what uh, qualities we should program for and what are unacceptable and on what criteria? Big question. Uh, is club foot excessively uh, burdensome? Cleft palate? Where do you draw lines on these things? What's behind this, it seems to me, is, uh, and it's well to advert to this, is a, is a major move in contemporary medicine, not only towards specialization, but above all, because of specialization, uh, in the notions of disease and health. Uh, my former uh, dear friend, late dear friend, Andre Helligers, used to say that there were four stages that he was put through when he was training as a physician uh, on the notion of disease and correspondingly, therefore, of health. Now watch what's happening. A brief description of each one. The first description of disease was of a, an inflammatory degenerative process which, if left untreated, would lead to serious disability or death. It was a very um, corporeal notion. Then the second stage uh, probably coincided with the presence of statisticians in the medical establishment. Uh, we had increasingly a whole series of diseases that were known as the hypers and the hypos. Hypercholesterolemia, hypoglycemia, hypertension, hypotension, and so on and so forth. These were not diseased in the same way that the first people were. But they were more than others likely to undergo an untoward event. Uh, what Dr. Hellegers used to call hyper-untoward eventitis. And, uh, <laughs> swallow that one. Uh, the, third, uh, the third development in the notion of disease was uh, corresponded to the uh, presence of psychiatry in, uh, broadly in the medical profession. Uh, it uh, basically described the condition of those who were uh, unable to function properly in society. If they couldn't do that, they were diseased, and they therefore needed treatment by physicians. Now, one, one can get uh, absurd here, and, and, and I will for a moment, uh, uh, citing my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Helligers, who used to point out that uh, in certain societies, the beautiful Jewish nose, fully capable of breathing out and breathing in, was a diseased organ. Why? Put it in Nazi Germany. And it's diseased. Now, if that seems ridiculous, all we have to do is come, uh, say, into uh, Canada or the United States, and we have another form of disease. You figure out how much money, how many millions of dollars every year are spent on reducing the size of buttockses, on nose jobs, on breast enlargement. Uh, these are people who don't seem to be able to function in society unless some of these things are done. Uh, I have to wonder about the concept of the human person that is at play when people cannot function because of, uh, of these pathologies. One has to wonder at some point who's sick. Uh, the fourth notion of disease and health is that of the World Health Organization, which described uh, health as the absence of disease in all of these previous senses, plus a sense of social well-being. So if you, had a, if you, if you lacked this sense of social well-being, you were somehow or other not healthy. You were diseased. Now, what you see happening there is an increasing broadening of the notion of disease and health to the point where doctors, physicians are being asked almost to treat the desires of people. Now, when you have that, you see the powerful support that gives to the eugenic mentality because everybody desires a healthy child. You see, And physicians will be recruited uh, to provide it. I think this development is ongoing. I'm particularly sensitive to it because of my work with the American Fertility Society. But I, I think it's something to watch. 
because of its repercussions on uh, how we're going to treat the elderly, how we're going to treat uh, defective newborns, whether they be uh, children with retardation or what. Uh, the next area that I want to take up with you is, again, a problem that you will not experience as intensely as those of us in the States experience it, because you've got a medical uh, health care delivery system in place. It's the major uh, bioethical problem uh, in our country. It's a social economic problem, and that is the problem of market-driven health care system. Now, by market-driven, I mean uh, institutions whose very existence and viability, hospitals, are heavily dictated by the economic factor. In such an atmosphere, one thing becomes clear. You are financially viable or you close. No margin, no mission. It's the shorthand. Thus we see, for example, in the contemporary uh, atmosphere uh, in the States, we see a competitive atmosphere. Hospitals have marketing officers. Marketing officers. They're experiencing pressure from all, all sides. Um, for example, from diagnostic-related groups. You may not be familiar with that. Uh, we have uh, in place um, a Medicare system um, which will provide uh, a payment of health care costs on a diagnostic-related uh, basis. We have about 470 or so diagnostic categories. You know, one would be, uh, uh, say, an appendectomy. Another one would be an endarterectomy. Another would be uh, cesarean birth, whatever. And the government has basically decided that it is a form of its Social Security that they will pay, but they've stipulated what they will pay and for how many hospital days. Okay. Therefore, if you go over your five days for a cesarean delivery, the hospital picks up that bill. And they'll only be reimbursed for what the government decides that DRG, Diagnostic Related Group, uh, deserves. Well, under this uh, system, of course, hospital stays are shorter, the censuses are down, people are leaving hospitals quicker and sicker, as we say. Um, in 1986, between 1980 and 1986, 414 hospitals closed. Uh, it is predicted by the Arthur Anderson Foundation or uh, group that by the year 1995, 700 more will close. These are all, by and large, in areas serving the poor, you see, either inner city or very rural areas. Um, essential services do not support themselves. Uh, when there is a, a, a tough financial pinch, everyone admits that quality is going to be sacrificed. Um, the dumping syndrome is alive and well, even if in very subtle ways. You may be familiar with that terminology. You come to the emergency room and uh, they take a look at you, and if you uh, have no financial resources and can't pay, they send you elsewhere to the county hospital or whatever. That's known as the dumping syndrome. Um, acquis acquisitive decisions, hiring practices, and uh, various incentive proposals are all governed by the financial factor. So I say this is a tremendous problem because we, we uh, being in an egalitarian society, we feel that a certain level of health care is the right of everyone. And yet, this is the way it's working out. Okay. In the shape of things to come, hospital stays will be shorter, there'll be more outpatient treatment, uh, there will be sicker, inpatient uh, people. Only those who are the sickest will get into hospital. Correspondingly, there will be enormous demands on the nursing staff expected to do, in the same period of time, much more work. Few elderly people will die in hospitals because they can't afford it and the government will not reimburse for it. There will be more elderly uh, home care and the indigent will remain 
without access to the system. Now, that sounds like a black presentation, but it's, it's, it's fairly accurate in terms of what's going on in our country. We're the only uh, industrialized democracy in the West without some sort of national health care. Now, back of this market-driven uh, symptom, uh, malaise, really, are, are three unanswered social questions, moral questions, preeminently moral questions. They are the following. What resources, in terms of time, energy, finances, uh, should be put into health care in contrast to defense, education, environment, etc.? Remains unanswered. Secondly, even within health care, how much energy, personnel, money, etc., should be put into rescue medicine? in contrast to preventive medicine, crisis medicine. We're very heavy into that, tertiary care. Um, the misuse of uh, intensive care units, I suspect the same thing is true here. Uh, the misuse is legendary. People who have no future, 93-year-olds, rushed into intensive care, kept there for two weeks at enormous cost, and then, they, of course, they die. The third question is, Within either category, either rescue medicine or preventive medicine, who gets what when not everybody can have everything? Now, if I could answer these questions, I wouldn't be here. I would hold down a very high-paying job in the federal government. But right now, I'm, I'm going to suggest to you that our health care institutions are slopping around in the unanswered character of these social moral problems. Um, clearly, as long as that happens, the sense of mission of Catholic health care facilities is going to be uh, seriously compromised. Let me move on to my next concern, and uh, that is, uh, has to do with the secularization of the medical profession. Now, that sounds bad. I come from a medical family, and uh, I've been hanging around with physicians and surgeons all of my life, and I uh, respect them very highly. So I don't mean that to sound the way it sounds when I first mention it. Let me develop that and show you what I mean. Um, there are two symptoms that we're increasingly encountering in the medical profession. One is physicians leaving the profession. See. Now, there are many identifiable reasons for this. One uh, is insurance premiums. All of these come to job dissatisfaction, of course. The business atmosphere of medicine. Medicine has been transformed, by and large, into a commercial enterprise rather than a humanitarian service. Uh, competition, the accountability structures that are present in our health care system, diminished public esteem, bad publicity, etc. A second symptom is the loss of idealism that we encounter in our younger physicians and medical students. Uh, earlier, there was an aspiration to be in a profession which is, was a profession of caring and curing, permeated with the notion of sacrifice. Uh, of course, we, we make money with our sacrifices. Nobody wants to deny that. But now, it's much more a business atmosphere. Much of the idealism has been drained off. And perhaps understandably, but many of our medical students uh, talk money and can't wait till they have the opportunity to pile it up. Pay off their debts, for one thing, <laughs> getting through medical school. So the very factors that I mentioned leading to depersonalization, technology, cost containment, and legal entities can easily lead to a secularization of the profession. Now, uh, that term must be properly understood. By that term, I mean, by and large, a divorce of the profession from a value tradition. Now, that manifests itself in two ways. First of all, an increasing independence of the profession from the values that make it a caring, service-oriented profession. Divorce. 
Secondly, an increasing preoccupation with the business factors that I mentioned before in medicine. Now, what is the effect of this secularization? I see it in two areas. First of all, the secularization of medical judgments. Now, let me, uh, let me develop that and show you what I have in mind. Earlier, some 30 years ago and in the decades before that, a heavy paternalism characterized the delivery of health care. Doctor knew best. Um, one can understand why that took place. My father was, uh, was a surgeon, wonderful surgeon that he was, was uh, highly characterized by paternalism. Uh, here's what you need. I know best. Do it. You see. Well, one can understand how that would happen because of the, as I say, there's a, a basic asymmetry that happens between the patient and the physician, health care deliverers. Here's a patient. Comes into a strange setting. Uh, is sick, powerless, dependent, confused, fearful. Over here, you have the physician, the nurse, knowledge, health, prestige, white coat, power. Well, these people know what's best for these people. You can see it's built into the very structure of the delivery of health care to be paternalistic. That means to make decisions for others without their knowledge or against their preferences. Now, that's the way it was practiced for some time. The reaction to that has been the modern emphasis on autonomy, the autonomy of the patient as incidental to patient dignity. We kind of reacted against that earlier autonomy and said, hey, wait, uh, the patient is a human person and is in charge of his or her own medical decisions to accept or reject medical treatment. All right. However, there can be an over-accommodation to the autonomy of the patient. You hear the physician say, I will not impose my views on the patient. Now, there's a, a genuine sense uh, for that statement. The genuine uh, and acceptable sense is that uh, physicians and nurses must take patient preferences, patient beliefs, and so forth into account as they go about deciding things with the family and the patient. Of the wrong sense, and this is the first result of the secularization of medicine, the wrong sense is this. I will do whatever the patient wants. In other words, the physician makes him or herself a technological instrument to do the bidding of those who will pay for the service. I call that the secularization of uh, medical judgments.